for years and years, uh, vertebrate paleontologists have really been confined to working with the shapes, with the morphology of bones and with skeletons, as you see behind me here. And our hypotheses about how these ancient animals lived and moved was based on uh, how we could put those bones together in the physical world. And now for the first time in the history of paleontology, we're able to move beyond uh, those methods and into this virtual landscape where we can test our biomechanical hypotheses in, in rigorous ways that were, were never possible before. My first foray into 3D scanning was actually working with a Drexel student in our college of media art and design. And he wanted to do a, he wanted to do a master's thesis that was uh, steeped in both science and digital art. And uh, so we used an early generation of scanner to scan a 65 million year old crocodile and he uh, put it back together, put the muscles and the tendons on, taught it to walk, taught it to swim and to hunt, and that was his master's thesis. And um, that master's thesis actually he took it into his interview with DreamWorks and he's a DreamWorks animator now. We scan the fossil, we clean it up a little, and then we translate that into an STL file. You can take the STL file, put it in another laptop connected to a 3D printer, essentially set a few parameters, push a button, and 10 or 12 hours later, kind of like the replicator in Star Trek, out pops the object. Scanners like this have gotten uh, better in recent years, more portable, and much less expensive. In the past, if you wanted to create a one-tenth scale copy of a dinosaur bone, it was strictly in the, in the realm of art. So you had to get an artist to look at the bone, to draw it, and then to uh, sculpt a one-tenth scale piece, and then to mold that, and then to make a cast from the mold. And so it was an arduous process, and it, you know, it didn't necessarily have the, the kind of fidelity that you want in science. And so scaling specimens was a huge deal. It was, you know, in most cases, um, cost prohibitive in the past. Now it's very easy to get a you know, one-tenth scale copy of a dinosaur with this 3D scanning and printing technology. It's really important and it's really a positive development that a high-tech uh, instrumentation like this is getting down to uh, affordable prices because not all areas of science are funded equally well. These kinds of scanning systems now, like the Next Engine scanner, uh, base price is about $3,000. That plugs into any laptop, but for a modest price, anybody can get into this field. And you know, it's to the point where you can have one of these in your house if you're interested in scanning, you know, Civil War artifacts or whatever it is that interests you. Being a paleontologist, I work with scientists in a lot of developing countries. And now, you know, cutting edge technology is becoming accessible to them as it proliferates. There's a move with intellectual property today to, uh, to make things open source, right? To open access, to democratize it. Uh, science has always been that way. Science can't be any other way. If other scientists don't have access to my original data where they can reanalyze it in, in their way, re-examine my hypotheses and potentially falsify my hypotheses, it's not science. So you, there's no way to keep science data locked up. And so this digital technology is really just a way to amplify the best and essential aspect of science, which is that it's essentially open source. So now, instead of a paleontologist having to fly from Spain to New Jersey to look at this sea turtle and to tell me how wrong I am, I can send him the file and he can correct me that way. And that's, you know, in science, we never really say that we prove anything. The best you can do in science is to fail to falsify your hypothesis. And um, you're not gonna do that if the data isn't open source.